Come one, come all. Here's your place for the nichest of topics. Welcome to another episode of the Adam Noise Podcast. Hello, everyone. My head is freshly shaven, so now I'm going to talk about some Shakespeare. This is the most pretentious I've ever felt in a very long time, ladies and gentlemen, but... um. So today we're going to be talking about Antony and Cleopatra 1972, a movie that I think no one on YouTube, literally no one on YouTube has ever talked about, so this should be fun. But this movie I just I just happened to come across, uh, you know, it just happened to slip into my radar not too long ago, uh, and I liked it so much that I had to get the Blu-ray, and I'm glad I did. Um, you know, at, at first I was, you know, just going to skip it over, seeing it was produced by the same man who brought the 1970 version of Julius Caesar. I don't really care for that movie. It's fine, but it definitely is inferior to the one made in 1950, directed by Joseph L. Mankiewicz. But then I saw that Charlton Heston was going to be directing this movie. So I had to look this up for myself. Uh, so I watched the film not really knowing anything about the making of it and thought the movie was good. I mean, it, was, it wasn't a masterpiece. Uh, not even great, I'd argue. Uh, but it was certainly good. And it saddened me to see how critics at the time panned and savaged this movie to no end. I literally could not find one positive review. And then I learned about the making of the movie. And to be honest, learning about the making of this movie only made me more saddened. It only made me sadder. Uh, especially in response to that terrible critical reaction that this movie got. Because watching Antony and Cleopatra and learning about how it was made was, and how it was really Heston's vehicle and just how he made it uh, made me appreciate the movie a whole lot more. A whole lot more. Uh, not only do I find the critical reaction of this film to be sad, but it also surprises me that little academic work has actually been done talking about this film in particular. There's Heston's autobiography, because he, you know, he wrote that himself, and then there's the great audio commentary on the DVD, but that's really it. So a part of why I'm doing this specific pod, uh, this specific podcast is twofold. One, is because I want to help promote this movie as much as I can. Really, if you can find a copy of it or somehow watch it, watch it. And two, if you want to get into filmmaking as I have done, uh, this is the ABCs of how you make a movie look larger than it really is. Now, I've also done a video on a similar topic uh, for an old show that I used to do called Stupefied Film History. Conquest of the, pa uh, of the Planet of the Apes and Antony and Cleopatra both have these fantastic overlays that don't... They're not really connected, but they, they are there. Uh, both were shot in Tadeo 35, not Tadeo 70. Tadeo 70 was what was originally good, and then Tadeo 35 came in. Only a few films were, were shot in that because it got, you know, beaten out by just about every other 35mm uh, film stock out there. But both, both were, had minuscule budgets and had to be creative with how to make their film look bigger. Uh, and both were released in 1972. Uh, both were made by reluctant directors. Uh, Conquest of the Planet of the Apes was um, J. Lee Thompson, and this one was Trouton Heston. Now, on the surface, both movies are absolutely nothing alike. I mean, uh, one's about an ape uprising, and the other is literally Shakespeare. Uh, but my god, um, the story of how these movies were made is inspiring. To, would inspire any independent filmmaker. I highly recommend you listen to the Stupefied Film History one. I think those are a little bit less professional than I would like them to be. I'm not doing that show anymore. This would be a, a, like a good part two to that almost. Because in this podcast, I'm specifically focusing on Antony and Cleopatra. Right from the get-go, I discovered that this was a passion project. Now, when I heard that, I said, uh-oh. <laughs> uh, passion projects in Hollywood rarely mix and often lead to disaster. Uh, to list a few of the big time examples, we got Cleopatra, Heaven's Gates, The Fall of the Roman Empire, and I'm not knocking those movies. I actually like those movies, um, but the key element was their box office returns, the thing that links them all together. There's no denying their box office returns either. They were wrought with production problems, 
overshoots, reshoots, and ultimately bombed at the box office. And again, those three examples were major passion projects. Passion projects to this day are seen as box office poison. Antony and Cleopatra was no different. Uh, you know, directors changed. Uh, I mean, Heston didn't want to direct. Uh, he wasn't a director. Uh, he wanted Orson Welles to do it. He said no. He wanted o Lawrence Olivier. You know, he was offered. He said no. Franklin J. Schaffner all but laughed Heston off of uh, off of the lunch table that they were eating at. Uh, so Heston decided to pick up the mantle himself, not because he wanted to, but because he literally had to. You know, already he was going to play Anthony. I mean, Charlton Heston is an actor. Uh, but he was also producing, though he didn't really get the credit for it. He was producing, um, he did the bulk of adapting Shakespeare's play for the screen. So his he's acting, directing, producing, and writing this movie. I am reminded of, uh, specifically John Wayne during the making of The Alamo. Heston was, was scared because he heard horror stories about John Wayne. Uh, Wayne was smoking five packs of cigarettes a day. I, I mean, the making of the Alamo, Alamo literally almost killed John Wayne. Heston seemed to be going through a lot of problems that Orson Welles was having on his own projects, you know, which there was a severe lack of money. Uh, I don't know why Heston wanted to adapt this specific play by Shakespeare. Uh, I just know that he played Antony many times. He was very familiar with that character, clearly loved the character, and perhaps that's why he wanted to do it. But Julius Caesar, the 1970 adaptation, that was a box office and critical dud. Uh, and that was released in 1970, so a couple years before Antony and Cleopatra. So it's not understood why Heston was so adamant on making this movie. Uh, and, and clearly the money people thought the same because literally no one was interested in investing into this movie. No one. To the point that Heston didn't really get paid for making this movie. He put out his own money at first, uh, then was reimbursed by the rank organization who put up a meagerly 1.8 million bucks. Okay. Uh, um, to people like me and probably you, uh, that's a lot of money. $1.8 million. You could do a lot with $1.8 million. But for a film with battle scenes, lots of extras, costumes, sets, etc., 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 that's minuscule. The way Heston was able to save money ranged from using already-made costume sets and actually going to Spain. Uh, speaking of Spain, <laughs> uh, this movie is why Heston actually stepped down from being the head of the Screen Actors Guild. He was fighting hard to stop bringing large productions overseas, and then suddenly he wants to bring his production overseas to save money. Yeah, that certainly tarnished his his reputation quite a bit. I mean, now he was seen as the bearded hypocrite. Uh, ironically, I think the only director who actually put his money where his mouth was on this issue of not going overseas was John Wayne during the Alamo, but I've actually talked about that in the past. I did a review on the Alamo. Now, shooting in Spain freed up a good chunk of money because of Spanish subsidies and cheap labor. That's why a lot of people went to Spain and Italy, specifically those, those two countries. Uh, a lot of the crew were either English or Spanish, some Italians, uh, and the locations were cheap to acquire. You know, that's what was incentivizing people to make their large-scale movies over there. Um, and lots of these sword and sandal costume pictures had already been made there. Uh, Heston was able to secure practically all of his Roman armor and even, even two barges that had been made for other movies. So, and, and, and here comes something else that I have sort of mixed feelings about. Um, this film only had enough money to really shoot one good battle scene. Uh, and it was clear that they didn't have the ships they needed to truly capture the scale of the Battle of Actium. So early on in production, Heston went on MGM. You know, he went to them and he asked to use some stock footage from Ben-Hur. Uh, he had to make a picture for them called Skyjacked, which apparently he actually enjoyed doing. Uh, and they gave Heston what he essentially wanted. Um, it's also clear that they use stock footage from Cleopatra, too. And apparently there are a few shots from the robe in here as well, uh, though I haven't been able to identify it. To be clear, this isn't stock footage like how we tend to think about it. Heston didn't use shots or clips that were actually played in those movies. Um, Heston and editor uh, Eric Boyd Perkins um, 
only used outtakes from Ben-Hur and shots flat out removed from the original, and still missing, six-hour cut of Cleopatra. None of the footage that was used in Antony and Cleopatra had actually been seen before. It's It wasn't like, uh, let's say, it wasn't like the 1970s Godzilla films, where they just lift scenes out of previous movies full cloth. Now, now stock footage and I have a mixed relationship. Uh, on one hand, uh, the producer in me understands and even applauds its use in this movie. It managed to free up money so that they could make their one good battle sequence. And they were genuinely creative with only using outtakes and, and shots removed from other films. And using this stock footage let Heston and producer Peter Snell, you know, really focus their efforts on that one land battle. And I gotta say, that one land battle is quite well done. Uh, their money actually did go a long way. The other side of me says that they should only use stock footage if the people involved with the production worked on the production that needs that stock footage. So Heston using stock shots from Ben-Hur makes sense to me because, you know, he worked on Ben-Hur. But using, you know, Cleopatra or the robe movies that Heston was not involved with at all, I'm not a big fan of that simply because that's work someone else put a lot of time and effort into. And now you can just use it for cheap, for like $2. Um, however, uh, to be clear, I'm all for reusing props, sets, costumes, all in which Antony and Cleopatra do to great effect. But stock footage? Eh, you know. I mean, at least it's nowhere near as bad as Midway made in 1976, where literally I don't think any of the combat footage at all was originally shot for that movie. Speaking of battle scenes, uh, the one big battle scene they did shoot for this movie is actually quite good. I mean, it's short, but uh, it's wonderfully shot by uh, by DP Rafael uh, Pacheco. I'm probably mispronouncing that, but that's okay. I've never seen anything else that he's actually shot. I've also got to say this because it, it, it comes up here. Uh, Heston surrounded himself with a lot of people he had worked with before. Uh, in this case, it was stunt coordinator Yakima Kanut. I'm not kidding, that's his name, Yakima Kanut. He's probably the greatest stunt coordinator in the world, or one of, certainly. Um, and, you know, they worked together all the way back on Ben-Hur, uh, where he performed all the stunts for Heston, essentially. And this guy, this guy could do some amazing shit. He was just really good at it. I mean, some people had their calling cards, this was definitely his. And I'd go as far to say that, that Yakima is why a lot of those sequences of Ben-Hur are as good as they are. Um, so Heston made Yakima the second unit director. So essentially, Yakima shot the battle scenes. Uh, a lot of people don't know this, but the first unit director rarely shoots battle sequences. It's usually the second unit director that does it. For example, in Ben-Hur, the chariot scene was not shot by William Wyler. It was shot by the second unit director. And it definitely shows an Antony and Cleopatra. Lots of hand-to-hand -hand combat, it, it, and it's visceral. People spitting blood, missing limbs. It, it's gory for a movie of its kind. And a lot of these decisions came from the production's limitations. Uh, a lack of extras for a long period of time, you know, caused the camera to, to move in. So what they decided was shoot these long and, and epic wide shots first, and then send most of those guys home and bring the camera right into the thick of the battle. I think that decision's genius, and a lot of people wouldn't do that. For example, David Lynch over on Dune, that is an epic sci-fi film, he would never have done this, and as a result, a lot of money was wasted. So it is interesting to note, but, but Orson Welles did something similar on his Shakespeare fan film, and that's what I have to call it, uh, Falstaff, uh, which has an amazing battle scene in it. Utterly amazing. And, I mean, Heston did approach Wells originally to direct. Maybe Heston learned a thing or two from him. Not sure, but it, it honestly wouldn't surprise me, because both men were some were at least indirectly involved with this. It, it makes me actually just want to go out there and make a movie. Uh, like, I if he could do it on such a low budget, fuck yeah, so can I. <laughs> Where you really start to see the low budget come out uh, on this film are the interior sequences, the interior sets. I mean... They're good. Don't get me wrong, they're good, but but it's clear they had to use them because they had no money to shoot on location. It, it becomes very clear uh, about that. And they aren't really colorful, kind of bland, especially compared to the films depicting this same story, like Cleopatra, like Ben-Hur, like the fall of the Roman Empire. Hell, 
Uh, I'll even put the sets from Falstaff on this list. But all those movies had a lot more money to work with. And a lot of money, with the exception of Falstaff. Falstaff had a minuscule budget as well. Now, to defend Antony and Cleopatra, uh, the film is in color, using high-quality 35mm film, again, Todd AO35, and thus more flaws can actually be, be picked out. Uh, I'll bet in Falstaff, if that movie was shot in anamorphic widescreen and in color, like Antony and Cleopatra, a lot of those same flaws that are in Antony and Cleopatra would stick out like a sore thumb. Now, to Heston's extreme credit... Heston knew he needed the actors to steal the scene in order to help draw attention away from the lackluster sets. And I think he succeeded. Uh, the only two roles that I'm kind of iffy about is Cleopatra and Octavian. And that's not so much because of their performance. It, it, I think they, they did quite good. Uh, but it's because of the shoulders they're standing on. Elizabeth Taylor and Roddy McDowell. They really come out of their own and give truly great performances by the end of the movie, specifically the final third of, of Antony and Cleopatra. Another thing Heston did was he... Apparently what he did was he would work with the crews nonstop, the actors specifically, and they would approach it like an actual play, like how Shakespeare wrote it. And he would work with them and work with them, and he'd work on the blocking and everything like that. So when it came time to roll the cameras, instead of having to shoot three, four, five takes, he only had to shoot one of two. Guess what? In the time of film, that saves you money. That being said, the side characters, <clears throat> and let's face it, Charlton Heston, uh, really keep this movie going. I need to applaud this actor, so I'm going to call him out here. Uh, Eric Prodder uh, did so well in this movie. Uh, as a man conflicted with the sense of duty to Antony and his realization of actual reality, uh, being that Octavian is the clear victor here. I, I've really loved his performance in this. And I also adored the acting of Douglas Wilmer, uh, who is in, you know, The Fall of the Roman Empire. He does really good in that. But I really know him from Jason and the Argonauts because he plays King Pelias, and that's where I know him from. And, you know, he's a good character actor. I think he deserves more credit. Uh, he's never had a bad role, in my opinion. A anything I've seen him in. He's also in um, The Golden Voyage of Sinbad. He plays the guy with the mask in that. The one scene that really, you know, sticks out to me where Heston knew the limitations of the sets is Antony's suicide attempt scene. It's amazing. I love that scene. It's my favorite scene in the movie. There's no music. Um, there's no clever camera moves. It's just a tree and a shoreline and a black background. And the performances are all so good here. It really showcasing the desperation and, and, you know, especially of Antony. You know, Heston is coughing out blood. Uh, he, he's angry that he failed to kill himself. His, his performance alone makes this scene amazing uh, and only affirms that Heston is truly one of the greatest actors out there. I mean, duh. Uh, I also love the lack of music here uh, in the sequence. It's it's all the performances and unsettling quietness amplifying the situation. Now let's let's look at the scene in Cleopatra in 1963. I mean, it's good. It's good there too. Don't get me wrong. But Alex North's score takes over the emotions when Antony runs himself with his sword. Here, all we get is Heston screaming in agony, grunting, groaning, spinning out blood. It's unnerving. It's visceral. It, it, in, in my opinion, it's a wonderful choice made on the part of the director, Charlton Heston. Speaking of a music score, or lack thereof in that specific case, but going to music, I gotta bring this up because if this isn't the definition of creative filmmaking, I don't know what is. For big epics of the time, you think of composers like Alex North, Dmitry Tiomkin, and especially Miklos Roja. Uh, all in which made some of the most epic and beautiful scores ever written. But Heston didn't have the money for them. Uh, so who do you choose to co compose the music for your movie? He went with a little guy named John Scott. John Scott had literally only done music for B-grade horror pictures in the past. That's it. I mean, he did the score to Trog, that was the first movie in his filmography that I recognized, and I can't remember a single track from that movie. 
And yet here he comes with this score, and it's huge, it's loud, it's sweeping, and it perfectly fits the scale of this movie. In fact, I would argue that Scott's score uh, elevates the, the many sequences from just being small scale. It helps elevate them to a level of epic, making many scenes stand on par with, you know, the most well-known sword and sandal costume pictures of the time. Uh, and I'll just say it now. I'll, I will, I'll just say it now. The love theme in this movie is probably one of the most beautiful themes ever composed. This score just goes to show how talent, or, or I should say where talent can come from. You don't need thousands of dollars to hire an already established composer. You just need to find that one person who loves his job, loves music, and wants to make the best score he possibly can. And it doesn't hurt that if he has something to prove. And that was John Scott. He worked tirelessly on this film's music score, having less than three weeks to compose, conduct, arrange, and record the entire score. And he did it. And it paid off. I'd go as far to say that Scott's music is the best thing about this movie. And that's not saying everything else isn't good. Uh, I think I've established already um, that it is. There's a lot of stuff in this movie that is good. Uh, but this score is what I walked away from remembering the most. But back to the idea of hiring people who are just passionate about the project. Or, or those who are, are people you want to be work with, working with. Those are the people you want by your side. Uh, how, how many good movies they've made in the past or awards someone has won won't make the movie. Uh, it's passion, it's the love of the craft, it's enthusiasm, it's having something to prove, it's the want to do the best that you can. Hire a DP who hasn't really shot much other than a few music videos or commercials, and he wants to make your movie look as good as he can, he has something to prove, it'll look good. It doesn't matter if he's an award-winning DP or not. Is Antony and Cleopatra a masterpiece? No. Is it amazing? No. Is it good? Yes. I won't lie and say that knowing the behind the scenes of this movie did not affect my judgment. It did. And it made me like the movie more. So keep that in mind. I think Heston did a fine job with this movie, and even he has to thank editor Eric Boyd Perkins for making the movie as coherent as it is. I really do think this movie is a good lesson on stretching your budget and being creative. Uh, it was Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan director Nicholas Meyer who said, Art relies on restrictions. And oh boy, did this production have them. Yet despite all of that, the movie somehow looks bigger than it is despite these limited factors. So reusing sets, costumes, getting an unknown music composer, using resources available, all made this production become bigger, and I'd argue, epic. And goddamn, do I want to make a movie now? <laughs> uh, I think anyone in this field who works with no-budget films or indies in general should really watch this movie and be reminded just what's possible with the right kind of creativity, the right kind of ingenuity, the right kind of mentality, and having something to prove. Go on Facebook and like all up to uh, and like any productions for all up to date information on what we're doing. All of my social media is in the description below. And in the end, this is Adam Noyce of AN Productions saying Sayonara. <laughs>